fiction, science fiction, horror, fantasy, drama, LGBT, thriller. You have now entered the house of mystery. With your hosts, Eric Shapiro, David North Martino, John Copenhaver, and Al Warren. FM Los Angeles. 102.3 FM Riverside. And 1050 AM Palm Springs. Welcome back into the house of mystery. I'm Al Warren. Mr. Eric Shapiro is here from his movie making. Hi, Al. How you doing? Yeah, I missed all summer because I was making a movie. Well, how's that going? Yeah, I missed you. No, it's going well. I'm, take, I'm taking a break uh, before I edit because it was very demanding, and I have other things to catch up on with business and clients, but uh, it came out good, so I'm excited about it. A lot of stress in the movie business now I, I, with yeah. streaming and everything, right? And did the strike affect you at all? or? Um, sort of, you know, it became impolitic to talk about it too much on social media, even though it was a non-union production, because, uh, you know, one wants to show solidarity with the, the strikers, which I had. So I sort of was just, uh, going about the process because it, it had been scheduled, uh, before the strikes began. So, uh, but it was non-union. So technically I was just, I was at a remove from that. Okay. Let's jump right into it. Cause we've got a great guest waiting here. We've got Mr. Richard Chismar, who's got a new book. Uh, it's the follow-up to The Boogeyman. It's called Becoming the Boogeyman. So thanks for being here, Richard. Uh, thanks for having me. Richard. Wow. So now, if I remember right, now you're, you're kind of focused on uh, a lot about the uh, obsession with true crime in society and stuff like that. Is there, is there something about that subject that, that sticks with you or a reason why you kind of focus on that? You know what? It's just people ask. It's probably the the first or second most asked question that I get when I'm doing a you know press for a book or just a general interview is you know where when did that attraction to uh, the dark side of of you know humanity um, you know take place for you and uh, and what is it about it that that does attract you? So it, it, it's something that I've you know I've discussed fairly often and and I've given a lot of thought and. Um, I just and, and it's something that I'm curious about because it, I, I think there's that fine line between people like me. Well, start with the reading audience or the viewing audience between people who really enjoy having that as, as part of their entertainment, whether it's scary movies or dark movies um, or books or comics or whatever it may be. And then there's, you know, you kind of skip over the next line and, and you, there's the creators, people like me who uh, and people like Eric who, who do this for a living. And then, uh, you know, there's another line over there where you kind of skip past that. And that's where you kind of get, you know, it gets a little unhealthy because it, it, it runs into obsession. And, and, you know, these are the folks who are who are kind of running around with, you know, T-shirts with Charlie Manson and Ted Bunny on the front. And, you know, the women who are writing letters to, to serial killers in prison and that kind of thing. So it's it, there's a lot of blurry lines in between there, you know. It looks like from the synopsis of the book, uh, I can tell it's being kept under wraps because I'm sure some shocking things happen, but uh, there's this dichotomy between people involved walking away from the story of a lifetime uh, in trade for keeping their loved ones safe versus sort of getting up, caught up in the darkness you're describing. Can you shed a little more light on exactly what that dynamic is in the story? Yeah, I mean, the interesting thing about the two Boogeyman books is is that, you know, I – you know, some of the reviewers think it, it was this brilliant move. Uh, I, I made myself the, the, you know, the lead character. Um, I, I'm sure plenty of other, you know, readers think, you know, what an egotistical, you know, idiot. Um, but it, honestly, it was the only way I could tell the first book, Chasing the Boogeyman. It, it's, you know, that book is set back in 1988. I'm freshly graduated from college with a journalism degree and I moved home, you know, back into the house I grew up with my, with my parents for like six months be, before I get married. Um, to save a few dollars and these killings you know are occurring in my small hometown in maryland and and the the reason i did this is because i really did move home all of that came you know all of that was true i said it in my real hometown in the real house you know i used my friends and family as as characters and and really the only thing that was fictionalized were, were the crimes were the murders and what i did in that book that really connects with this book is i tried to be as honest as i could about 
you know, my involvement in, in the, the dark side of the world. As far as, you know, chasing the boogeyman at that age, I was, I was working on the second issue of Cemetery Dance Magazine, which has been around for 35 years now. Um, I was submitting my own short stories to, to various horror and mystery magazines um, and, and beginning to sell a few. So, I, you know, I was trying to build a career as, as, a, as a creator in, in this world and, uh, and also publishing a magazine and, and, and kind of setting down the seeds for becoming a book publisher also. And, and I tried to be really honest when I told the story because people would ask me all the time how much of it was true. And I said, well, everything except the murders. And even then, I tried to you know, be as honest as I could and how I would react to them. And, and in one scene, you know, I remember I, I made a comparison to the, to the weather reporters who you see, you know, say on the Weather Channel, when a hurricane is about to hit the coast. And obviously these, these folks aren't wishing this to happen. They're not wishing for, you know, millions of dollars of damage to be done and people to lose their houses and floods and, and the whole thing. But they, they still can't really disguise that internal excitement that they can't help but feel. Because this is their this is their life, this is their job, and these things are happening, and it's one of those moments. And and I tried to you know shine that spotlight on myself in the first in both books actually, and and, and you know including times when it didn't necessarily you know sh you know kind of uh, exhibit a positive you know spotlight on myself. Um, and so between the first and the second book, the second book is is modern day. It takes place in you know now. Um, I've made a career out of this. I've, I've been successful. I've had films made. I've had books published. I've worked with Stephen King, you know, everything like real life. Some people don't like that, you know, in, in the book. There's, you know, this is a whole new world and, you know, compared to 1988. So there's message boards. There's blogs. There's people who like to say that, uh, you know, my house with the nice pond in the side yard is the house that the boogeyman built. Um, and, and that I've, you know, made a career on blood money and things like that. So, it, it, you know, it, that's the dynamic I'm, I'm, I'm exploring. Um, you know, when, when the book jacket copy talks about, you know, walking away from the story of a lifetime, you know, it's talking about me. You know, w w to what extent am I willing to risk everything to follow this story and to, uh, to con continue to examine, you know, what is happening um, across that line? And, and, and I think what you see is, in, in some cases, it's it's more of a quest for understanding than it is an obsession with, you know, the bad stuff, I, you know. And, and I, I think becoming the boogeyman is very much me coming to terms with the idea that you don't necessarily always, you're not always able to understand. Sometimes you just have to let it go and uh, just, you know, keep living and accept the fact that it's, you know, it's unexplainable. You know, I've, I've, I've written 32 crime books now, and I've been through that experience. But you put yourself into this as the main character. I can't help but wonder when you're living as that main character and going through the process of writing the book, now that you've written two books really centered about some of your own experiences, how, how do you think that's changed you? Um, I think, you know, like I, like I said, I've already been very kind of thoughtful and, and aware of you know, of the dynamic that exists, but, but I, I'm even more aware now and, and I'm even more thoughtful. Um, you know, the book I'm about to finish is a standalone horror novel. You know, I can't say it's affected the writing of it. It's made me, you know, go tamer or it's made me, you know, you know, uh, kind of flavor my writing or, or my storyline in any particular way. So yeah, no, it hasn't really, you know, it hasn't really affected anything other than it, my already cluttered head. But yeah, I, I think it, it is an interesting, thing to write about yourself and that comes from true crime books you know the, the the true crime books that i've found i've enjoyed the most have been you know the ones where the the author has uh, allowed him or, or herself to to become part of that story they feel so passionately about it or it really was you know factored in their personal life so that they had no other choice and uh, that's what you know that's what the boogeyman books are they're kind of my version of true crime books uh you know where i can kind of make it up instead of having to do all the research like like the real true crime writers do you feel solvent on this whole, in this area, when push comes to shove and your head's on the pillow, do you feel solvent in terms of using darkness in your work and profiting off it? Or is it something you struggle with, or do you feel uh, morally you're at peace with it? Yeah, you know what? Morally, I am at peace with it. I, you know, I had, that's the thing. I think that's why I had so much fun poking fun of my, at myself in becoming the boogeyman and, and kind of making me the bad guy for some people. Um, it, you know, they're, they're, the, the story is told you know, uh, you know, through a, a variety of techniques and, and some of it is, you know, message boards, 
posts. And yeah, I had fun, you know, saying bad things about myself because when my head hit the pillow, you know, I'm comfortable. And and that's the thing. I, I, I've said this before in interviews about, you know, my attraction to true crime books, you know, was a fairly, you know, recent one over the last decade or so. And uh, what I discovered, you know, by reading stacks of these things is you can find out very quickly whether the book is is written well and written from a good place, from a from a pure place of someone truly wanting to, to honor the survivors and and and, you know, the victim and, and you know, explore you know, the, the perpetrator in, in, in a dignified way. And, and, you know, then there's books where you read it and you're like, okay, this guy got offered five grand and just dashed this off in two weeks and, right. and it shows. And, and, and so, yeah, I, you know, I, uh, yeah, I, I'm good with that. And I, I mean, and, you know, again, it, it's kind of diabolical in some ways, but with both books, I would have preferred to not have a novel, you know, printed on the front cover so that people would have, you know, perhaps even, uh, you know, believed it more. I, a lot of people say, you know, they, they missed that. They missed the disclaimer in the front of the book. So they spent a lot of time Googling. And, you know, my initial plans were for Chasing the Boogeyman to, to Blair Witch, the audience. I, I, I wanted them to believe this was the real thing. And, uh, you know, I wanted to plant a fake website online, fake newspaper articles. Um, I wanted to shoot a little behind the scenes uh, d- documentary of, of the actual thing. And, and, and use some of the same actors that I used in the photographs in the book because there's there's photographs at the end of each chapter. Um, but my publisher's legal department squashed that really quickly. <laughs> Especially like in this day and age when the uh, you know with fake news and people like really not having a handle on what's real. Like I can see it getting really out of control. Like you know, like e- even even when the cat's out of the bag and it's made clear that it's fictional. If you even at one point along the way uh, suggested otherwise, like they would never let it go, and it was just like lead to all kinds of madness. Yeah. I mean, surprisingly, it was my oldest son who, who is not the most conservative uh, when it comes to, you know, risk taking and, and, and filmmaking or storytelling. He's, he's young and bold. Um, but he was the first one to tell me like, he's like, dad, you can't do that. You know, you're, you're going to like drive the housing prices down in Edgewood and, and yeah. <laughs> you know, start all these rumors and people are going to buy guns. And, and, you know, and when I hung up from that, you know, first or second uh, phone conference with the legal department of Simon Schuster. I was like, son of a gun, he's right. <laughs> but yeah, it, uh, it, yeah, it, it, even with the disclaimer and the novel printed on front, I, it, there are hundreds of messages here from, from folks who have said, oh, I bought it all the way to the end. I bought it until I Googled for the sixth or seventh time, and, and then I figured it out or I saw some comments. Right, right. Um, including a handful of people who got mad, who were angry. They, they felt like I... I cheated and, and I pulled the wool over their eyes and the photographs weren't fair. And I'm, I was just like, you know, did you get your $25 worth of entertainment? Because that's <laughs> what it's designed to be. And the fact that you're in it also, um, everybody inevitably, no matter what they know or don't know going in, they're going to be wondering where the line is at all times. Like, right. So, I mean, that, that remains fun, but I think it's good to uh, let it out from the get go that it's, it's a novel because it creates a, I think it creates a more like uh, joyful good humor about it yeah, to some extent um, that it's, there's like a, a sense of gamesmanship. Yeah. Yeah. I, I agree with that. And, and, you know, ultimately, and like I said, that's, that's the nice thing is, is I did hear from a lot of readers who felt it was so immersive that they, they started knowing it was a novel, but then they started questioning it. And I think in today's, you know, climate, that's probably the best I could hope for. That's fantastic. Yeah. What did, what did you have in mind? when you started these books, like were it, it, and did it turn out the way you expected them to? You know, when I started chasing the boogeyman, I was not a main character. I, I, there's an introduction, which kind of, you know, glosses over the story in a way. And, and, you know, my intentions were, you know, normal, just let's whet the reader's appetite and, uh, and, and then get, go into detail about this town. And get, it, it was uh, what I was doing is I was following a true crime book format. You know, it was not, it, it, you know, narratively, it's a slow start because the first chapter is about the history of the town. And then my, you know, a long section, a very nostalgic long section on my kind of growing up there and how it was our world. And, and then how those boundaries, you know, gradually, you know, expanded outward. And, and but th- the point was, is I wanted them to get to know the town, you know, intimately and share those experiences uh, of my past so that they were so that they could hopefully feel what I felt when these murders started, which was this sense of uh, invasion and, and, and wrongness. Um, 
you know, to my safe place in the world that, you know, even though I graduated from college, I was, you know, it was that weird age where you're on the cusp of adulthood, but you're not quite there yet, you know, and, and I'm living in the bedroom I grew up in, you know, so I, I said, you know, I'm looking out the window at the ghosts of my childhood. So it, there was a lot to play with there. Um, but I, I got halfway through that introduction and I realized, okay, this is me. I'm not trying to disguise the fact that it's my town, my old bedroom and all this. I said, so why disguise the fact that it's, you know, really me and it's this other, you know, narrator. So that's, that's how it happened. I went back and I started the intro over and, and I, you know, kind of put myself there and, uh, and the book just flew because of that. It, it, it was, you know, I can't remember how many, you know, people are murdered in the book, but it was so much fun to write, which sounds horrible. Um, but all that stuff. And, and then when I was finished, I had no idea what I had. I said, this is a really strange, my agent didn't know I was writing it. I was supposed to be writing something else, but this, you know, just took hold of me. And when I told her on the phone, you know, she was really surprised because I, I don't, I, you know, I don't get out to book conferences or book shows very often, and, and I'm very much behind the scenes. So the idea that I put myself into a book was kind of a strange choice. Fortunately, she loved it, and, um, you know, and, and it went from there, and, and Simon & Schuster bought it right away. And uh, and the reader reaction was really positive. You know, I had that moment a week before the book came out, kind of where I am right now with the second book where I thought, what, and there was a lot of buzz, and I just thought, what are people going to think? Because it's really not this big story. It's, it's it's kind of a campfire story about the boogeyman coming to town and about some, you know, schmuck from Edgewood, Maryland. You know, who's going to care about this? And what I was thrilled to realize as reader response started to come in was it, it, it wasn't just about me. It was about everyone who grew up in a town like that. And I heard from so many readers who said, you know, I forgot what it was like to pop tar bubbles on the road or to jump ramps on my bike or, you know, to, to climb trees and have crab apple battles with my buddies in the neighborhood. And so th that was the cool thing is, is I, it, w it was a good reminder for me that, that, you know, you're never really just writing. No matter how personal the story is, it's always, you know, something that you're going to find the connection with readers with. So that was a neat kind of neat after effect for it. Nice. Yeah, that, that leads to something else I was going to mention in terms of when you commented Oh, you know, X amount of people were murdered, which sounds horrible, et cetera. I mean, I think the bottom line when it comes to this, um, in terms of darkness being counterbalanced with light and these nostalgic memories coming up for the readers is that really all comes down to your insight. I mean, I think with any book and any subject and any author, that's, that's what really is the quote unquote selling point. It's like, it's the insight you bring to it, regardless of the subject. And if that insight captures it in a truthful way, you've done your job. Right. Right. Yeah. I agree. You know. Yeah, and, and and the first book was very much kind of a love story to my hometown and growing up, and uh, and the examination of, of of evil, and then this, you know, all these years later, this one's kind of a love story to to family and my wife, who who is the only person through two books who hates being in the book. Um, <laughs> she's uh, like very much behind the scenes, and it's just she hasn't read it yet. She refuses to read it until it comes out in paperback. She said that way I don't have to discuss it with. Everyone who reads it at the signings and everywhere else, I can just say, I haven't read it yet, don't tell me. Is, is she in it a good deal? Does she just factor in, like, at the margins, or is she fully depicted, or how's that work? Oh, yeah, she's in this second one. She's a full character. I mean, she's, <laughs> you know, the, the, it, it, like I said, it's modern day, so my youngest is out at the University of Virginia at college. My oldest is up in the attic bedroom, uh, you know, writing his own stories for his Patreon page and selling his first novel, and... I'm doing my thing and she's doing her thing. And, and, you know, everyone kind of gets sucked into this web because, because of my past and what's going on in the present. So yeah, she's a major part of it. And, uh, you know, in the first one, she was my girlfriend, she was in college. So she was definitely just on the peripheral. Um, but this one, yeah, she's, uh, she's at my side for a decent amount of it. And, uh, she's, uh, in anything defamatory. No, no. That's, that's just all you have to be careful about. I would threaten her. I'd be like, yeah, it's, you know, I think I'm going to have some romance in this chapter. And she'd be like, yeah, yeah. You make your own dinner for the next month, too. <laughs> so, no, it's funny. My friends are all thrilled to be a part of it. You know, my kids don't care, but they think it's cool. And, and you know, on like that. But And my neighbors are, are, are fine with it and excited. But uh, she wants nothing to do with it, so. Uh, I hear you. <laughs> what is her particular? I'm not, I won't stay on this much longer. But what, what is her particular concern about it? Ah, uh, she's just a, she's just a behind the scenes person, you know. I, I oh, yeah. I, neither one of us like to, you know. There was there's because of the success of the last book and the Stephen King books. Um, yeah, I mean, there's days where she comes home and she's like, 
okay, I was at the bank. I did the deposit, deposit slip. New teller said, oh, Chismar, the, the writer, are you related to the writer? Yeah, that's, you know, I'm married to him. Oh, he talked about you and chasing the boogeyman. And then she's oh, like, yeah. that afternoon, I had a bad appointment. The woman at the desk said the same thing. You know, we, we live in a fairly small town. So so she does. She just doesn't like that kind of intention, and nor do I. I'm, you know, I'm, I've been in bookstores quite a few times when people have had my books in their hands, and I've n- never have and never would say a word where I know plenty of writers who'd be like, hey, that's me, which, which is yeah. fine. You get it. You know, you, it's a cool moment. It's a cool feeling. But no, not me. I've seen people reading, you know, a book from me, you know, on the beach. And uh, yeah, uh, there's no way I'm saying anything. I might try to sneak a picture of them and send it to my uh, <laughs> my kids, but that's it. So yeah, neither you one. Tell them it's a like terrible that, book. No. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, that down. It's an awful book. It that's sucks. terrible. So you're the one who pays <laughs> my twenty bucks. <laughs> uh, Rich, when, when it comes to depicting yourself, do you enhance or romanticize yourself at all, or do you try and get the most straight up uh, authentic version you can imagine? reacting within the fictional scenario. I really do. Uh, in both of these books, I, I really did my best, to, to be honest. I, I teased my family in, that in the second book, you know, that I was like, like I worked out twice a day, five days a week. And, you know, I, I found the first body because I was out jogging for, you know, training for a triathlon. And they're like, Dad, you know, your, your idea of exercise is fishing. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, things like that. So I, I threatened them with that, but I really didn't. I, uh, you know, I I feel like that would have pulled me so far out of the story that uh, that you know it, it just wouldn't have worked for me. So I tried to, like I said, even when it didn't necessarily shine a good light on me. Sometimes I, you know, there's a scene in the first book where there's a photograph has blown away from one of the memorials that was left for the victim, and it's you know it's like 25 yards down the sidewalk, and and I pick it up and I look at it, and instead of walking back, I put it in my pocket and I take it. And, and it's like that that was a coin flip for me because I'm like, if I really was obsessed with what was going on in my town, knowing me, you know, that would have been kind of creepy for me to do. So I probably would have put it back. And I'm like, but you know what? You never know. There was like 50 other pictures there. So right. what, they're not going to miss one. So there were moments like that where it was kind of an arm wrestle. But most of the time, it was a pretty easy like, I, I would have known what I would have done. I believe it. And it serves, I'm sure it serves the completely imaginary component of it to, to steep your own personality as deeply in realism as possible because then everything that stems from it just benefits from that yes yeah you know? yes yeah i mean it, it's and and like i said both books were were a joy to write and um and just you know the, the first book I, I tell people i'm like my parents have been gone for over a decade both of them but not when i was writing the book i was living in their house eating my mom's cooking and talking to my dad and you know, uh, it, it, that's that's kind of a, a unique opportunity for a writer, you know, to actually be writing about himself and these people as they were. Um, same thing with some of my friends who are no longer here. Uh, well, what was the gap? How many years was it between books in real life and in fiction? What were the gaps? Fiction, uh, Chasing the Boogeyman is 1988. Right. Um, so like I said, I'm a, I'm a fresh-faced, you know, graduate with a degree and, and that I have no intentions of using because I'm going to start this little magazine and comp- publishing company. And then the second book is set in 2021. Or is it 2021 or is it 2023? Hell, I don't know. But, but yeah, but, you know, I'm, mid-50, I'm in mid-50s and, 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 it's, and it's, you know, everything is, is, is as accurate as could be. I mean, I even wrote about my own house and, and, and all of that, which is, you know, people have said, I don't know if I would have done that. I'm like, ah, oh, we got to get security system. We got cameras all over the place. I think it's okay. Yeah. Well, wait, and wait, so when was the Boogeyman published? Like, it takes place in 80. Yeah. The first one was 21. Oh, okay. So there is, I'm, I'm getting the time first. Is there any uh, thought in your mind of, uh, you know, when you're in your 60s, you follow up on it again? Does it leave, is the door open for that? Yeah, the door is wide open, um, and I, I had no intentions. I had no intentions of writing the second book, um, but I was out mowing the lawn in one day and not thinking about it, not trying to think about it, and in the space of five minutes, I the entire first chapter to the sequel, including the big um, reveal, that there's a reveal that happens at the end of chapter one in Becoming the Boogeyman that ties it directly to Chasing the Boogeyman, and should hopefully um, make a lot of mouths drop open when they read it. Um, and and that's what happened when I was on the lawn. Five minutes, I was just like that whole first chapter was there in my lap, culminating with that reveal. And, and then by the time I, you know, 
took a shower. I was like, man, I got to write this book. So, oh wow, I uh, I had signed a two book deal with Simon Schuster, and I just, you know, they wanted the standalone to be next, and I was like, I I said, I'm, you know, I'm sorry, but this book's going to come out one way or another. So you either, we're either going to have to extend the deadline or, or you can do the sequel next. So we ended up just doing the sequel next. So I'm finishing the standalone now, but that's what happened. I had no intention. And same thing when I was writing this, no intention of there being another book. But when I got to the last chapter, there was one and only one way I could end it. And I realized that as I was writing that chapter and it leaves the door wide open. So I was just like, I guess I'm coming back and there's one more book where I'm going to torture my wife. And <laughs> And write about myself. And there are days where, you know, writing about yourself is just like, this is weird. And, you know, I, it, people are going to stop believing that I am a hermit and, you know, would prefer to stay <laughs> home and, and stay out of the spotlight if I keep doing this. But there's one more chapter to tell. So when that, when that's done, I'll, uh, it, you know, I'll put it away. Got it. Got it. Now, is there a world in which you might imagine forward into a speculative version of yourself who's older? Or you would just wait, or is the other version a couple years from now, or do you not want to say too much? Um, you know what? It would have to be a direct continuation, but that doesn't necessarily mean it. it, it and, and I haven't decided which which path to take yet. It, I was going to say it doesn't necessarily mean that the time jump can't be, you know, five years in the future or five months in the future. Or, I mean, honestly, the way it ends, I could, you know, the last the last book could pick up a week later a year later or a decade later. So yeah, I could be writing about a 65 year old. Oh, that'd be interesting. Uh, you're yeah. So, yeah. So you sort of rezone the whole thing. You should put uh, Al Warren in the third one. No, I will. <laughs> I will. You know what? I the there's murderer. a lot of podcast references in this one. And there's a lot of, uh, and, and a few are fictional, a few are real. So if, if, uh, you know, it's impossible to do it accurately without, talking about all the the podcasts and the message boards and the websites and uh that was that was a consistent editor note um from ed schlesinger who who is a wonderful man who who i'm working with at, at gallery books and was was yeah more of the modern technology rich and stop having yourself hang up the phone because you don't hang up phones anymore really you, right, you know, right. <laughs> he's like you can tell you're in your 50s with you know your uh, technology references stuff so he, he was really uh uh, integral to me kind of, you know, modernizing it. And, and cause I had that stuff. I had it from the start, but he, he, he encouraged more of it. God, I still write the words hang up. If it's a cell phone issue, is that not advised anymore? Mm, you know what? I kept a couple of them in there. Yeah. Yeah. The way I write is very conversational and I just wanted that you know, in there. Cause what are you supposed to say? Turn off? Like, uh, just connect, um, and the call, just connect. Oh, right, right, right. Okay. you know, that kind of thing. Um, oh, okay. but really, it was really, it was more, it was more just, Hey, Rich, a little less, you know, newspapers and, you know, television news and a little bit more, right. you know, CNN.com on, on Twitter and, and all of that kind of thing. Got it. Got it. Got it. Yeah. That's good. That's a good, good advisement. But you know, in my book, it's still called Twitter. So I'm already, I'm already outdated. Yeah. It's amazing how quickly it goes, but I think most people are still calling it Twitter anyway. So. I am. Yeah. yeah. Twitter yeah. X. Twitter X. Yeah. Did you ever figure out what the obsession was with true crime? Do you ever come to any sort of, you know, um, kind of uh, an idea of what – did you resolve that, kind of go, well, this is why people are so nuts about true crime? I'm not sure you can resolve it. I, I, I'm honestly not sure you can. I my, my opinion, my two cents, for whatever that's worth, is that it really does come down to this um, this quest for understanding. And, and maybe I'm putting too much weight in my own – thought processes because i do realize that that's very much what it's about for me it's, it's about trying to understand these human monsters um what makes them tick how they got that way whether you know uh, there's some of them who and i explore that in becoming the boogeyman who i think there's a chapter called the making of the monster where you can see where the one of the guys in this book you can see how he was made you can see how that that dark side of him was nurtured and fed through his youth and uh, and where it, it brought him eventually. And then there's others who, you know, you read these true accounts of some serial killers who, you know, they grew up, they grew up like I did, you know, and, and you know, no family is perfect, but in, in relatively, you know, happy families, healthy families, um, healthy, you know, relationships, they were not abused, they were not, you know, exposed to this and that, and yet somehow, they became fascinated with, with, you know, with killing and, or, you know, 
uh, first harming, and then it you know it progressed to that. So uh, I, 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 for me, it's it's just about that wanting to understand. And there's a there's a Stephen King book called From a Buick Gate, where it, it kind of the entire underlying theme of the book is how sometimes th- there are things. There's in that book, there's a young there's a young man who's trying to come to terms with the death of his father, who was a state trooper. And by the end of the book, he, what he learns is that there are times when you just simply are never going to understand. And you can't just stand there shaking your fist at the sky all day or, or you're going to lose your own life in the process and your own joy. And sometimes you have to walk away and accept those things. And, and, and I think that very much that's what it's about for me is, is, is trying to understand some things, but being healthy enough sometimes to just walk away. It's, an, it's a really weird thing, you know, and I know one of my last books when I met the killer in 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 prison and spent a couple of weeks with them i i don't know my my goal was to try and understand it better but i don't know if we ever really will because people like that they they have a there's something else going on besides the family and and what they grew up around i think that that allows it to to grow that way but there's there's something else going on you know yeah yeah, no, I, I mean, I, I would not disagree with that. I just think, for the most part, it's th- there's always going to be those cases where you can kind of fit it neatly into a box. But I think f- overall, it, it's just not meant to be understood. And uh, you know, I, I, man, do I respect the people who, you know, and law enforcement yeah. and, and yeah. The, uh, the who are trying to understand it so they can prevent it and they can stop it. That's uh, a hell of a way to make a living. And I'm, I'm glad I. Like I said, I admire and respect him, but I'm glad it's not me because the way my brain works, man, I'd be down that rabbit hole and, and I'd be divorced and, you know, my kids would be like, you know, I'd be drinking and the whole thing. I, I would be a stereotype. Yeah, I am. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> no. I was yeah. waiting for that. <laughs> I, I wasn't sure to go that way or not, but. Uh, like, you know, it, it's it's an unusual business, and it causes. That's why I asked about how how it feels for you, because uh, when you're right into that world, because I I live in that world, and there's a lot of times certain cases, especially the modern ones, when you deal with them in the family and you go through all that experience, it really sort of has an effect on me personally and how I come out of it, and and I don't always notice it until a few years later. You know, it's sort of mm-hmm. so when you get into something that's very real, you know, because I mean, how do you respond to criticism like people that are sort of not happy with you doing this book, for instance, or complaining or stuff like that? How does that affect you in a sense? Because I'd imagine you probably didn't get that much personal criticism before. Yeah, you know, I, it, it's it's interesting. I uh, I think 35 years being on the editorial side of the desk has helped just me have it, you know, been able to have kind of that healthy distance from any kind of criticism. Whereas I just, you know, right from the beginning, I understood that, that no matter how wonderful I thought a piece was, there were going to be people who read it in the magazine and, and took offense or just thought it was boring or didn't like it. Um, so I, I just think that's been so kind of, of drummed into my mindset that, uh, that I, you know, I, I and, and most of the time as a writer, when you tell this to people, they don't believe you. Because the, the Ed Gorman, who, who was a mentor for me and uh, crime writer, well, he wrote everything. Um, and he published a lot of my early short stories. Um, he, uh, you know, he was one of those guys who never believed me. I, I would try to tell him, be tougher on me, do this, you know, uh, spit it out. And he's just like, he never believed that I had thick skin. And, and uh, because I think there's a, a fair share of writers who say they do and then they don't. Um, but I've always been able to take it and I've always been able to kind of just roll with it. And I don't listen to the praise very closely either. I just, you know, I, I think I, I, you know, I went to college on a lacrosse scholarship. So I think that athletic background, you're constantly, you know, being uh, guided and coached, critiqued, yelled at the whole thing. So when it comes to writing, I think that really did suit me well. Pretty amazing. So where, so where do you off to next? Like what, what you're doing a standalone, is it more backed into the uh, horror straight, straightforward horror? You know what? It's it's. Uh, I'm working on the ending now. I'm working on those final like ten thousand words now, and this is for me. This will dictate, you know, whether it, it ends up being. It's definitely a horror novel, but is it more of a thriller than it is horror? You know, similar to the Boogeyman books, or or is it tip the scale the other way? Um, it's another period piece. It's set back in 1983. 
it's uh you know three college students who are there it's a road trip novel they're they're doing this road trip to to do this uh project for american studies class they're doing a documentary on those roadside memorials that started popping up back in uh the 70s and 80s kind of you know where an accident you know at, at an accident site and the whole thing with the crosses and the flowers and and all of that and and what it is is they as they're doing as they're chronicling these different roadside memorials, they uh, start recognizing that there's a similarity. There's something, uh, and I, I can't get into that part of it too much, but th- they're starting to, to recognize some similarities that are on the ominous side. And the more they uncover, the, the you know, the more they're in danger. And uh, it takes place out in the Appalachians in Pennsylvania. So it's a pretty cool setting, and uh, it's fun to go back in the 80s again and not have cell phones and all that stuff. Do you ever think our time would become kind of like the, the flashback, the memories, you know what I mean? Like when we're growing up, we look back at the 60s. And, and, uh, no. and now it's, it's everyone talking about the 80s. It must have been so cool to be alive in the 80s. Like I get that. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I got I get those smart-ass comments. Like, you know, your, your book is set in 1988. You know, my, uh, uh, you know, I was not born until 2001. I'm like, yeah, whatever. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Boy, it went fast. Yeah, the weird thing is I really think, and I know every generation says this to some extent or another, I really think it was better before. Like, I didn't think I'd be a person who ever said that, but I, I really, like, think the 90s was better than it is right now. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah I, I'd be hard-pressed to imagine somebody uh, disagreeing if they could compare the two side by side. But being old, I think the 90s was people were in a better mood. Yeah. Things were happier. Yeah. But I think we go through these trends, you know, back in the 60s and early 70s. It was it was really a tough time. All the all the assassinations and the riots and all this stuff going on. There was pretty intense feelings uh, back then, and it was a bad mood. But it gets better. I think we just go through waves. I'm hoping. I mean. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's cyclical. It's just a question. I, I agree that it, it goes in waves, but I... It's just a question of, like, will we see the wave change again? <laughs> like, or is it going to happen uh, in decades and we won't be here to see it? I, I'm with you. I'm with you. I can't imagine anyone. Uh, unfortunately, there are, there are, there probably are, a, you know, a, a fairly decent, you know, size section of, of people right now who are like, this is the best of times, you know, and, and but uh, but no, not not very many people who I know. They, they look back fine. Yeah. My kids were chasing the boogeyman. They, they, wide-eyed they're like dad you guys roam the streets like a bunch yeah. of street urchins, you know and they're like you had such freedom and i'm like yeah i said you see those things on tv it really was you know you checked in for lunch and then you, you know you, you looked for your friends you found some you were on an adventure you came back for dinner and then you didn't you weren't back in the house till dark you know and and you could walk around at night and do this and that and uh they were just very wide-eyed about that whole thing and 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 you could tell there was some longing there, and uh, it was, yeah. Yeah, right, rightfully so. I mean, yeah, um, it was a special time. I think, uh, I mean, it's one thing to point to the Internet and social media and addictive mobile devices, which is all, this is all causes all these toxic problems. But then once you add COVID and what has happened politically to it, it's like, yeah, how could you not find? And I'd hate to be that way because I'm like, oh, I sound like an old man. Like, I'm only 45, and I'm still, yeah, I'm like, it would be nice if the pendulum swung and like al said you know people's moods improve yeah hopefully and like you said hopefully we're you know we're here to uh we're here for that i'm I'm a decade older yeah yeah you know they got to stop reading these these awful horror books <laughs> yeah. yeah these awful nostalgic horror books <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, true crime books that's the worst <laughs> you know yeah the true crime ones are really tough oh I, I you know i i <laughs> I, you know, the, the, especially the photographs, and I try to tell people, you know, I'm like, look, you know, most of these books, they don't have graphic, you know, gory photos. And, and I said, they're not the ones that that haunted me anyway. I said, it, it was honestly, the, you know, the ones where they showed like a patch of grass behind a shed in a suburban neighborhood and the grass is kind of pressed down. And there's, you know, and that's the crime scene. That's where the, the young lady lost her life. And, and I would just stare at it because it was so normal. And I'm like, I've seen that seen you know a patch of grass behind a shed a hundred times in my lifetime and just just to think that this person who did nothing wrong you know her, her life ended there so those are the pictures that really haunted me you know just these really mundane everyday sights 
but they had, you know, a different meaning. Ugh. Yeah, and I think I personally I like to, with the more modern ones, I get it, the family survivors involved. Yes. They've got to be part of it. I even have some of them write um, a chapter, and some of them, I want them to be in it, and I don't want to show pictures like that, I, and I don't get into the gore. Like, um, I'm not going to sit there and talk about, you know, the blood dripping and going through all that. Right. There's other authors that will do that. I personally want to get more into the behind the scenes and what's going on with their lives and wh- how these things affect people that live on after the spotlight is gone. Right. You know? So, I mean, that's kind of how I tackle it, but it's still very hard, you know. Yeah, no, I, I can't imagine. Well, listen, um, so listen, you're an easy guy to find, I'd imagine, but just for listeners that don't know, so where do people find you? Do you have a website? Do you have social media, all that stuff? Yeah, yeah, I got, I got pulled into social media kicking and screaming and ended up loving it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, to be able to hang out with readers and, and other writers, and because, like I said, I don't get out much, so that that's fun. And 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 I've been fortunate. I'm like one of the few who, like, you know, how many people have you have you had to block in a decade? I'm like, I don't know, three or four, and they're like, what? Oh, that's good. Yeah. So yeah, I'm on Facebook and uh, Instagram and uh, Twitter X and uh, got a website and all that. So so yeah, and people, I'm really easy to find and and almost always get back to people and and enjoy doing it. Yeah, well, there you go. Now we're going to have we'll have your website, your book, everything up uh, on our website, so people can find it real easily in case they don't know who you are. But that's wonderful, hard, hard to believe. So <laughs> the book, becoming the boogeyman, Richard Chismar. So thank you for coming on. Oh, thanks for having me back again. I appreciate it. Thanks so much, Richard. Thank you. Take care, guys. You've been listening to the House of Mystery Radio Show. To find out more about our guests, hosts, or shows, go to www.houseofmystery.com. Show's over for now. Was it as good for you as it was for me? Yeah. Good night. This has been a production of Sunday Media. I'll be back.